Thank you. This is Research Matters, and I've got uh, Dr. Eleanor Parker, who's a quite a remarkable historian from my perspective, because she combines understandings of literature with, yeah, with a, a really deep period of the past, deep simply because there's not actually a lot of contemporary material from that period in, in, in the written word. Um, it's the Anglo-Saxon period, and she's just written this wonderful book, advertising here, okay? So this wonderful book on um, Anglo-Saxon, the Anglo-Saxon year, and Eleanor's using poetry, Anglo-Saxon poetry, uh, to describe the kind of life world experience of a people who obviously are no longer with us, but who inhabit all of us Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Australians, should I say, um, whether we like it or not. Um, so we've got a deep history there. And I'm really very touched and honoured that, Eleanor, that you chose, uh, said yes to my invitation, because as I said before, we're a very little university in the middle of nowhere in Australia type thing, which from a British perspective is nowhere anyway. You just sent your comments. <laughs> I would say that. <laughs> but we do have good beaches uh, and and so on. Um, so Eleanor is a um, lecturer in literature at Oxford University. I forget which college. Which college is it, Eleanor? Brazen, Brazenose College. Brazenose, okay. And, you know, as I've said, she's a... Uh, a historian, but also a. Do you describe yourself as a historian, or do you say you're you're more of a literature, whatever you? Yeah. Want I'm kind of very much in between the two, and there's no. I mean, historian's a really useful label, and literary scholar or something like that is not as convenient. So I usually say historian, but actually my work is mostly on the literature side of things. Yeah. Or somewhere okay. in between the two. So, Eleanor, tell us just a little bit. Tell us a little bit about the book. Actually, that might be a nice. Mm intro for us all yeah so um the idea of the book as something that's been kind of growing for quite a long time um partly out of my research partly out of my teaching and partly out of some of the things that i um i had a, a blog that i was writing for quite a long time about um trying to sort of make anglo-saxon literature more accessible and available to you know people who haven't encountered it because it's a you know it's not a form of literature that people come across often unless you know they've kind of studied it at university or whatever you know you don't study it in school and the language is quite inaccessible so it can kind of be hard to get a hold of it um so the book kind of I'd, I've been thinking for a long time about ways to bridge that gap between mm. the sort of people who are, who are really kind of interested or intrigued by Anglo-Saxon literature, but find it quite hard to get into or don't know where to start with it. And then my interest in um, medieval sort of perceptions of the seasons and the cycle of the year and festivals and the kind of history of all of that. Um, so the book is it takes its shape from the cycle of the year it's called a journey through the anglo-saxon year and it's sort of you know from the poetry of winter which there's a lot of in anglo-saxon literature because they had very hard winters and they write about it a lot and then through kind of um you know christmas and easter summer festivals harvest um and how different poems and texts sort of help us to understand the anglo-saxon experiences that you know the experience of those moments in the year that's, yeah, and I have to say your blog is wonderful. It's the Clark of Oxford, yeah? That's right, yeah. And I have no idea how I discovered that you and your book and, and you on Twitter because I follow you on Twitter mm. too. Uh, and you're always putting up these lovely little things that, um, you know, th we're entering Lent or, we, you know, this is whatever it is. And you often have a little bit of an Anglo-Saxon poem there or a fragment or whatever. So it's, it's, you're, it is very accessible, you know. Um, I'm... Admittedly, I'm a nerd, and I have done some medieval history long ago, uh, so I obviously have some emotional investment in that. But even so, I'd say it is uh, your. It's a really great blog, and what I will do is I'll put up a link to the blog underneath this recording when we finish. But let's step back a minute. So. At universities, most academics are doing some kind of research, right? And obviously, you've researched a lot to to produce that book over a number, quite a number of years, I would imagine. Now, can you frame for us how do you see research? What is its purpose, really? I think for me, the purpose of research is is kind of 
it's about exploring new ways of thinking about you know a particular topic of, of study and something like my subject um you know as you said earlier there's not a large corpus of anglo-saxon texts um and they've been studied for a couple of centuries at this point um so it's not really about finding new texts but about new ways of thinking about them um, and connecting different understandings of the period um i think often interdisciplinary approaches are very important i mean i talked about the fact that i'm somewhere between history and literature um so i often you know my research takes in work that's being done in history and literature and i think a lot of medievalists are very often interdisciplinary because you know that's sort of the nature of dealing with a period that's a very long time ago you just want as much information as you can to provide context and, and sort of understanding um and then for me that aspect of of trying to in, you know um offer these new ways of thinking about the period or about the text or the, the corpus or whatever but also to connect that with wider public interest in the period is really important because you know the medieval period and the anglo-saxon period as i said people are often intrigued by it but they they just don't have the opportunity to go really in depth with it and to engage with what's going on in academic research is really difficult if you're not kind of in the academic world so i think um you know for me it's really important to kind of bridge that gap between conversations that are happening among academics and the sort of research and knowledge production and so on that's being done among specialists and then the wider public who are interested in it or could be potentially interested in it excellent yeah no i can see that and one of the things that comes through in the way you unpack the poems and so on is the humanity of the people yeah. that are writing these and that um and for me, I could feel uh, a link with my own experiences of time, the weather, whatever it might be, yeah. the cycles, particularly the cycles of the mm. seasons. And I felt that was uh, that you communicated that very effectively. So how do you go about research? You, you must spend a lot of time in dusty corners of, you know, the Bodleian or somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. Can, you, can yeah. you tell us how do you approach <laughs> your research, please? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I do. I just spend a lot of time in the library, you know, with um, reading, reading the text themselves, background reading, you know, just can't read enough, essentially. Um, but for me, I'm also someone who, you know, I like to, to, to develop my ideas through writing. So I'm not kind of somebody who tries to do all the research first, and then you start writing. For me, I try and start writing quite an early stage of the process to try and just for my own purposes, get my ideas into words, and then um, kind of be um you know to, to sort of thinking and writing going on at the same time um mm -hmm. yeah do you um i was just thinking i, I told you uh, before we started recording that i was very interested in material culture do mm. you do things like go out and walk the you know mm. fields or go do you, do you have a mate who runs archaeological digs and sometimes you go off and stand in some anglo-saxon you know building or you know yeah. not, not the building anymore of course it's just like the shadow of the building on the ground do you do that sort of stuff yeah i do i mean you know anglo-saxon um history is kind of interesting from that point of view because there aren't very many standing buildings so you can't like go and stand in a building the way you might in a medieval cathedral or something um but you absolutely can walk the landscape um and i live in the thames valley so not in oxford itself but just a bit outside where there's quite a lot of things like anglo-saxon burial mounds and mm -hmm. roads that we know were there in the anglo-saxon period and fields that have not changed their boundaries since you know a thousand years ago and i really like you know kind of yeah trying to get out into those kinds of landscapes and think about what they could see and what they might be you know how they might have understood those sorts of places um they're kind of uh, particularly the, the burial mounds i'm really fascinated by because they they have a bit of a presence in the literature um but they also acquire a lot of legend and myth about you know dragons or ghosts or whatever and um, they're very numinous sorts of places that's a lovely word numinous i like that um yeah so tell us about something that you're working on now so you've produced this book it's been very well received from what I can gather from the the uh, reviews that I've seen so what's next what are you doing now yeah so I'm, I'm kind of in the early stages of the next project um which is also I, I'm kind of thinking about something taking a similar approach to winters in the world um in that kind of for a, a wider audience but based on research you know proper research and i'm thinking about um anglo-saxon wisdom poetry and proverbs and proverbial literature um which is a big part of the anglo-saxon corpus there are a lot of really interesting poems which are sorts of collections of proverbs or wisdom statements um 
And again, it's a, a kind of corpus that's often quite hard for modern readers to engage with because we don't think, of, you know, we don't think about proverbs in the way that Anglo-Saxon readers did as sort of um, repositories of, of conventional but really valuable traditional wisdom. Um, so I'm sort of reading around that at the moment, thinking about what kind of themes are most interesting or what emerges as um, aspects of the text that, that might kind of make sense as a way of organizing that material. Yeah, that's interesting. So mm -hmm. I, I hadn't thought about that. So you're <clears throat> suggesting that proverbs today don't carry the same cultural weight. Yeah, yeah I think that that's right. Yeah, I mean, I think well, you know we do use proverbs, obviously, but in Anglo-Saxon culture, as in quite a lot of um, you know predominantly oral cultures, wisdom is something that's handed down through the generations in the form of proverbs or sort of wisdom poetry or something, um, and it does carry a lot of cultural weight in a way that we don't, you know, little proverbs that we use today sort of don't quite have that, although in one yeah. sense they're in the same tradition. I mean, I'm just thinking I'm quite a lot older. So I'm thinking about my old nana, you know, who right. was from Manchester, actually, and she okay. was from the north. Uh, and But she had, you know, sayings for everything, a stitch in time saves nine, you know, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. They probably aren't proverbial in the same way that your meanings, because the Victorian period kind of almost yeah. uh, sanitised those, those things so that they became, mm -hmm. and of course they were picked up by the working class almost as, mm -hmm. a, as an entry perhaps to middle classness yeah. um i'm just thinking about that any thoughts on that before i push on <laughs> um yeah i mean i think in one sense actually those kinds of proverbs that you're talking about are probably an important inheritance of or mm -hmm. version of the tradition that, that you get in in the middle ages um but i think the thing about um medieval proverbs is they they sort of span what you're talking about kind of working class or sort of popular culture but also quite high level elite mm -hmm. culture as well you know kings speak in proverbs and and bishops and archbishops sort of preach in proverbial forms and taking on proverbial um ways of thinking or oh, yeah. expressing themselves so it's a, a kind of a it spans the the classes in that sense yeah excellent i mean so you, this is this is wonderful i'm uh, really enjoying it but you know i i know we have to wrap this thing up and i that's right now um, where do we go and let's so i'm I'd spend a lot of time working with undergraduate research students who are just learning the ropes. What would be your advice to our beginning researchers? I think it would be to keep an open mind all the time about what you're interested in and also sort of how it relates to your broader interests as a person or your, your sense of purpose or whatever. Because um, my memory of that period of when you're sort of beginning as a researcher, you know, maybe starting a PhD or whatever, on the one hand, you're you're learning about your area of research, but you're also learning about yourself as a researcher and what matters to you and how you work best and what you value doing most. And my experience has been that institutions will tend to incentivize certain kinds of research or certain approaches to research that but you have to find your own way of doing it. You have to find the way that works for you. Um, so I think being open minded about sort of the sense of research is a, a journey and you don't necessarily know the ending is really important. You, know, like you don't know where it's going to a journey where you don't know the ending uh, because to me that's what keeps me going is just yeah. the internal curiosity of what's coming yeah. around the corner you know what's the next yeah. book that's going to come across my desk which is going to get me all excited and, mm -hmm. and so on as well um for me there's a conversational dimension the dialectical process or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it around research yeah. because we don't research in a vacuum no that's right and so who would be some of your heroes, your research <laughs> heroes, or are they old old people or are they very recent? I mean, you could say that Jeffrey Monmouth or Ed Bede or someone with oh, yeah, yeah, right. their, own, their own way. But, you know, yeah. who are the a couple of people that you might say, I, th this person really excited me and turned me on when I was just at that moment where I didn't know whether I'd become a dentist or a Oxford. <laughs> you know? Well, that's a really good question. Um, there are a couple of things. I mean, obviously, you know, my own teachers and supervisors and so on were, were a big influence on me and still are. Um, I One of the things I really like about studying the medieval period is that in a way, research never goes out of fashion. So 19th century researchers still have really interesting things to say or early 20th century texts, you know, mm -hmm. they're not obviously with research moves on but there's you can go back to those older researchers and still get some really interesting stuff um 
And one text that I often talk about that really kind of inspired me as an undergraduate is a tech, it's a book called The Lost Literature of Medieval England. Um, and it's an investigation into, um, you know, what we don't have really, how much has uh, you know, references to texts that are lost or what might have once existed, oh. but no longer survive. And that sense of a kind of vast hinterland beyond the, the surviving texts um, was really interesting to me. So that's that's something I kind of think about. <laughs> I'm going to look that book up. I, had, I don't know that one. But and so, Eleanor, I, I want to thank you very much for giving us your time and your thank wisdom. You and so on. I really uh, think you've got to get cracking on that next book. We want to see that one out. So that, <laughs> then I might have another excuse to have a talk with you again. Um, yes. But famous last words. You'll have that. You can have the last word, and then we will uh, we will end and for another day. <laughs> okay, I have to come up with something wise to say at the end. No, maybe um, maybe you can, <laughs> do you have your book there. You can pull up and read us a little poem. Oh, I, I don't actually. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's in the other room. <laughs> Fair enough. I should have had it right in hand to do the advert, but yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll, we'll. I think silence is also very wise sometimes when we don't have anything to say. <laughs> so we'll stop there. And I just, once more, I'll say it again. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. It's good to talk to you. <laughs>